Um, hopefully a lot of you got um, some time to review over um, the walkthrough I put up here. Um, what I will do is I'll spend um, part of the beginning of class going back over some of that stuff, but I'll go through it very quickly um, just to kind of familiarize you with, um, you know, with Yara. Um, so one of the reasons I'm bringing this particular, oops, this particular tool into the class is just that um, in my experience, uh, it's been, it's become pretty ubiquitous uh, with malware analysis as its own kind of pattern. Uh, language. Um, so those of you who've taken the automata class um, here for the computer science or computer engineering uh, undergrad or graduate uh, program uh, may recognize some of the concepts in this. Um, but for um, uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, what it is is a pattern matching language. So the idea is you observe, uh, you analyze uh, what's in the malicious file, and then you try to describe using a lot of logic and different patterns, different byte strings, uh, how to search for that information in another file, um, or I should say in a large pile of, uh, of files. So um, that said, um, this page here is uh, really, really beneficial to look at. You can see um, it has had a large adoption rate here. So a lot of these companies, um, so you might recognize them like Trend or um, Tanium or, you know, FireEyes probably on here as well. Um, CrowdStrike's going to be on here too. Um, so a lot of these different uh, companies are some of the common inf information security companies. Um, a lot of this is indicative that they have taken this free tool on the Internet and they have built it into the software that they use and they resell to consumers and enterprises. Uh, so for any of you who may go into uh, the information security field after this class, um, this particular library, this particular pattern matching language is going to be the type of uh, the type of thing that you're likely to encounter out there in the field. And probably the one thing uh, among all other like different security libraries and security um, tools that you're likely to come in contact with no matter where you work, um, if you're going to do malware analysis or incident analysis, that type of thing. So it's got extensive documentation. Um, there's a lot of pages here. I'm not going to go through the entire documentation myself. Um, but I will do, or what I will do is um, kind of go through some of these examples. So I thought it would be easiest um, just from a readability standpoint to kind of um, get your feet wet to pull the text of a um, you know, well-known story um, off of Project Gutenberg, which uh, if you want to do, especially if you're in a graduate program and you're doing some sort of uh, work on kind of text uh, analysis and stuff like that, um, this is actually a great resource because they have, you know, all these ebooks here. And they actually have them broken out into a bunch of different formats uh, that might be useful for your, uh, your research project. So I, a lot of times, will go to this when I want to do some sort of content or text analysis uh, work, uh, such as in this case. So that said, um, this right here, I, mean, I have the whole thing on the screen, so this is about as big as I can get it. Uh, it looks pretty readable on the monitor. Um, this is about as big as I can get it. Uh, and still have it readable on the screen here, or still have it fit in the view. <clears throat> so the YAR role is basically broken into these three different uh, sections. Um, the first section is this meta section, and really what this is is uh, there's, no there's no definition here for these different fields. Um, these are kind of arbitrarily defined fields uh, that you can add to any of the rules. Um, the, they're really helpful for, say, organizing uh, your rule set and, um, you know, that type of stuff. Um, so basically, um, I don't think there's any upper limit on these, or if they, there is, it's really high. Um, this is an opportunity to kind of over-document, um, because uh, one thing that I have learned doing this for many years um, is that um, something that seems like you don't need to document it at one time, uh, then four years later uh, becomes... Uh, 
uh, it becomes uh, clear that you should have documented more um, because you don't know uh, why it was written in the first place. So I've always found error on over documentation and you can basically document anything you want here. So a lot of common time, a lot of common things that I might do, um, I'll like go in here because we've been working with it, but um, you know, I might open up like rule one, which I think is this one, right? So I might open up this rule. A real common thing that I'll run into with, uh, you know, with different malware rules that are written off of uh, malware samples that I've analyzed is I might end up wanting to put like the MD5 checksum in there for the file that I used. Like this, the file that I used to generate it in the first place. So, so there we go. Or I can say, you know, hash MD5 one, like that. I can choose to name it whatever I want. Um, the nice thing about this is that uh, then I can take this and I now have a permanent reference between this rule and at least one of the malware files that I used to generate it. Another thing is, uh, you know, I might um, maybe decide that I want to do this so that I can tell myself where I can go back and get that file again in the future, right? So where did I get this from? Where is the source from? Uh, so those of you who may work with um, a tool called VirusTotal, um, which is a big online malware database, uh, that's usually a subscription service, but a lot of the security companies out there pay for the subscription on behalf of their employees, and some of the other security teams out there do that. Um, you know, this is a, you know, really good uh, place to put that information as well. Um, or you might, say, pull a URS signature that happens to be posted inside of a web article or something like that. So it's a good way to kind of embed that information in here so that you can more easily find the answers you're looking for in the future. So, but I can just keep adding more and more and more of these things, uh, and it doesn't really... Uh, care doesn't really think that I'm adding too much. So the next section is the strings. Um, so as I mentioned on the um, in the content of this uh, uh, lecture notes, the strings is really a set of patterns. So I have string constants. Um, so just like I would use grep uh, to try and look for these things. So I might do like grep, you know. Um, Queen in Alice.txt. I might do grep I queen, right? So just like I might do that. Um, and this is kind of one of the tools that um, that Yara was based on. Uh, was a lot of people would use grep uh, for doing the, you know, content finding, content searching, stuff like that. Uh, so it supports, you know, by default supports these static strings. Um, it also supports an, uh, it also supports the regular expression format uh, for searching as well. Um, I do get into that later, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, later on at the beginning of this lecture. And then finally, conditions. So um, <clears throat> how the Yara rule, Yara rule logic works is you give it a list of things to look for within the file. So in this case, I've given it three items to look for that are all string constants. It's going to search through the file to find every single um, location where those exist, uh, and then it's going to use a. It's going to run them through a kind of combinatorial logic uh, condition section that basically tells Yara, um, you know, how to say that this is a positive or negative match on this signature. Um, so uh, the idea here is that rather than running maybe three or four different grep commands, I can actually combine that logic into one single, um, you know, complex script here. So that's the idea with Yara. So in this case, and I'm going to go back to the uh, syntax highlighted view. So 
Give me one second. So in this case, what I'm trying to look for is any one of these three strings. So I'm looking for all of these strings in the file, and if any of them appear in the file, then I want Yara to basically say, yes, this signature matches the file. So, uh, and you'll see that I still have the customizations I made left there, so I'm gonna save that. And running Yara, it basically looks like this. Oops. So, by default, what it does is it'll run it and it'll tell you if that matches or not. So for instance, I can try running it against uh, the malware file that I gave you last week. And you can see that it doesn't find any of the uh, strings that I extracted from alice.txt. It doesn't find any of them in the malware file. Uh, so it exits like this. Um, also, if you're familiar with return codes in Linux, um, this one doesn't do that, but yeah. So the return code's always zero. So basically what it says is, um, show me the, <clears throat> show me the output uh, if there's a match or not. Um, I'm actually trying to see if there's a modification to this. That... So uh, it doesn't do a quiet mode. So basically it's the presence or absence of output that tells you whether or not there was a uh, pattern match. So um, if you get a positive match, it looks like this. Uh, what I might do is I might do this. So. So I might try changing logic to say all of them. Uh, if I do this, what I end up doing is um, the equivalent of this. So I'll say all of them. Uh, this is the nice other thing that you can do, and I found that you can't over comment as well. So all of them is basically doing an uh, and match. So if every single one of those strings exists in the file, then it's going to match on all of them. So I can do this just to show you that this is going to be the, these two are going to be the same. And these two are going to be the same. So now that it's looking for all of them, <clears throat> it doesn't match. And the reason for that is, um, if you remember earlier, when I ran grep, when I tried to use uh, grep to look for queen in Alice, queen, the word queen doesn't show up, literally. Um, and that's because... I have to do it with a capital Q. So by default, it's also doing case-sensitive matching. So it's basically doing a verbatim match on the program. <clears throat> so, and I go into this a little bit um, with a little bit lengthier explanation in the, uh, um, in the lecture notes. But basically what I want to do here is I want to take uh, these strings and I basically want to tell Yara that uh, I don't want it to consider case when it's trying to make the match. So uh, Yara has this additional feature <clears throat> that's called modifiers. So you can, um, because it's a pattern matching engine, um, so I can start adding these modifiers um, to, the, uh, to the code here to try to look for um, maybe a, a variable version of the string. So in this case, um, all three of these now I've set to no case uh, so that it will consider any possible casing of each one of these strings. So there are, you know, for queen, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different variations that you can use to capitalize in lowercase the different uh, letters uh, in that word. 
Um, this allows you to basically say, I want to consider all of them without having to literally permute every single one of them. So if I do this, and then finally I get to see that the all of them case that I have right here works. So that matches on all of them. So the next thing that I often want to do is, um, you know, I use this a lot. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have a large library of rules and then I'll mark, say, different places I got them from and things like that inside of the metadata of the rule. Uh, what YAR allows you to do is if I pass the dash M modifier for, uh, which is short for metadata, it'll take all that, all those keys that I put in the top section of the YAR rule. It'll actually include them in a nice structured list for me right here. So I could hypothetically, um, if I really wanted to be simplistic about it, I could do something like this, you know, We could just make a handful of small modifications. Yeah. The problem is it's not JavaScript. Well, I suppose I could have loaded up Rhino, um, but here you go. What am I doing? We got a third one. Oh, thanks. There we go. And so then, you know, I can structure it. So if I wanted to, I could run this stuff through a very simple Python filter. Um, or what's really common, and uh, you'll learn about this later, um, is that if I dump all of these, you know, if I dump all these rule hits into something like, uh, you know, Splunk or Elasticsearch or something like that where I can... Uh, have it parse uh, the output into field uh, data, uh, then I'm able to um, <clears throat> I'm able to search on each one of these things. So, for instance, you know I can now look at the URL source um, for every single one of my rule hits, right? And so, in my case, I might um, get uh, yar I might build yar rules from uh, different malware samples. So for instance, we've been calling the one that uh, I've been using at, for the example in class, uh, revolution shell. But throughout class, we've probably made about five or six different uh, variations of it, right? Um, so I might actually want to have references in here that mark both revolution shell and then maybe generation or something like that as separate fields. That'll give me the ability to say, um, you know, run my YAR rule that's trying to discover information about or trying to identify uh, different malware samples uh, against a large library of unknown files, um, I might be able to use that to count the different samples that I have from each one of them. So, but yeah. <clears throat> so getting back to this example, um, that can be really helpful, uh, especially because um, it kind of separates them with the uh, square brackets as well, so it makes it really easy to parse uh, if you use a, a handful of, you know, uh, command line tools. It's like, even if you want to go old school with set and awk and all of those things. <clears throat> so then the next thing uh, that I might want to do um, is I know that it matches the file, and I know that there were three string or three string values that I was looking for within the file, um, but I don't actually know um, what of those, or I should say how many matches there were for each of those three, um, nor do I know anything about the different, say, um, uh, upper and lower casing and that type of thing. <clears throat> so what I can do is I can run, and I'll keep the run up here, but uh, I can run the command with the dash s modifier, which allows it to output the string content. So um, this isn't the content from the Yara rule. This is the content from the actual file itself. 
Uh, and you can see that depicted here uh, with all the Alice's I have on the screen. But then the last one is the all capitals Alice. So that rule pattern with the no case that I added in here allowed me to um, uh, allowed me to basically match any variation of Alice that I wanted to. So um, you know, a lot of times what I end up doing um, <clears throat> is I'll actually use some of the command line tools to um, to slice this up and give me summary information about it. So one of the things that I would like to that I'd like to know is um, <clears throat> I already know that there was a rule match. Um, I might want to know how many times did each one of the words match um, or each one of the string patterns match. Uh, so in that case, I might want to try and count this middle value here um, to try and see um, how many of each one of the string names, the things with the dollar sign, how many of each one of those show up in this output? So I'm going to look at the second field, and I'm going to consider each one of these to be the different fields. <clears throat> and so I've got uh, some variation of these tools um, in the lecture notes as well. Uh, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the output to cut, which is going to slice out this middle part here. It's going to slice out this middle part here for each line. It's just going to print that out. Uh, then I'm going to sort it, which is something you need to do before you do a, uh, a unique count, which is this over here. So what this is going to give me is that there were the string Alice matched, or I should say the pattern Alice matched uh, 404 times. The pattern queen matched 77 times. The pattern rabbit matched 54 times. And then also, I got this weird thing. And that weird thing is, I'll show you. Like, why did the URL show up there? And the URL showed up there because um, the first line, so what it does is it'll print the rule that matched, you know, plus it'll print the metadata that I asked it to print with the dash M. So it'll print that, and then underneath that, it prints a list of all the content. Uh, so if I was to give it multiple rules, for instance, um, if I wanted it to search in the uh, alice.txt for all the things that I showed you, and then say I also wanted it to look for the, I had another rule that was looking for the word hatter or something like that, um, or mad hatter even, uh, it would show all of the uh, matches grouped by the different rule um, that's looking for them. <clears throat> so in this case, it's looking for, uh, you know, it's looking for queen. So I might have, you know, we'll just do this. Yeah, we'll do one really quickly here um, to kind of show, actually, you know what? I'm going to just put it over here. So I might have another rule down here that is, you know, um, and I'm going to do this really quickly without all the comments. And I'm going to uh, do a... Uh, We'll just do like, you know, fight, right? I can type. <clears throat> and I'll show you um, this one of them, uh, basically them ends up kind of matching any, uh, a list of any strings um, or any patterns that you provide in the uh, file. Uh, so this says that one of them uh, has the match. You can also do like, two of them has to match or something like that. So if I put five strings in here, I could have it match any two of them, but not just one. Um, and it could match anything more than two of them as well. Um, but right now I'm just going to say one of them. I'm going to put header right here. And then I think that this should... Yeah. And... 
Let's not show the output right now so you can kind of see what this looks like. So now what this looks like is it's got a, and what I'll do is I'm going to, I'm going to add one more thing here, you know. just so that you can see. <clears throat> so basically what it does is it'll take the rule, uh, the rule file, which is this .yar file, and it'll look at all of the different signatures or rules that it has within the file, and it'll match them against the output. And then when I do this, It basically sorts them in the order that they um, are matched in the uh, rule file. So I'm guaranteed to have anything that falls under this be the um, you know the queen rule. And then if I was to look for this, there we go. There we go. Header. Um, I'll go up a little bit. Go up a little bit. There we go. So you can see the Alice's that I had at the end of the last rule run. And now that I added that extra signature, which was Hatter, um, you can see that everything shows up underneath it. So uh, what it does in the output is it groups things by the different rules. So the output is actually going to be sectioned out by the different rules like that. So a lot of times what I do for, say, a summary output like this, uh, that I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to find out how frequently do each one of these words actually show up, um, I want to look for ones that have the position at the beginning of the line, like that. And so I mentioned that in the lecture as well. Um, but this is kind of how I build those um, iteratively. Uh, one of the reasons I have to do this is that um, this type of logic wasn't really what YAR was designed to do. So YAR is kind of like um, it's kind of like graphing away, um, or some of the other pattern matching tools that you might have used in Python or Ruby or Perl. If anyone still writes in Perl these days, um, <clears throat> it basically will give you a positive, a yes/no, or a true value or false value on whether or not it matches the rule. Um, but it wasn't really designed to do a lot of the field extraction and stuff like that. So you end up having to do a lot of that stuff yourself with other tools. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're working with it. But, um, you know, so you can see um, this stuff right here, um, you know, hopefully demonstrates like a very kind of quick and dirty uh, way to, to build rules uh, using it. Uh, one thing all throughout there as well um, that might be worth looking, you know, I'll actually jump into a handful of these as well. Um, there is this public repository called Yara Rules um, on, uh, on the internet. Uh, let's see, I think there's actually a website associated with it as well. Um, yeah, so there's this web page here that's associated with it as well. Um, the web page is really helpful because it, um, it talks about oops, it talks about a number of um, you know kind of talks about the background of the project and everything, um, but also talks about a large number of different tools uh, that the authors of this have found out there that are useful for um, you know for working with their YAR rules. Uh, so you can kind of see how people are uh, taking this code and then employing it in a number of open source products. So this is a really good example right here. Um, <clears throat> there's a disassembler called um, called R2, which is sim or Radar2, uh, which is kind of similar to Ghidra in some respects, um, but it's a lot more kind of command line focused, um, and it's a little bit more um, uh, it's a little bit more obscure. Or this is a um, there are a lot of shortcuts that you have to memorize in order to use it effectively. Uh, it doesn't have as many um, helpful GUI hints to, to lead you around. Um, but this is a 
project that kind of merges the capability that's in Yara uh, with the radar to decompiler. So um, anyway, feel free to read um, about these things um, to try and see how people have used it. Um, you know, there's also these other, um, also these other nice research projects that have gone in here to try and find all sorts of information about, uh, or I should say, use Yara to try and derive all sorts of information about large libraries of malware samples that have been collected. So in this case, um, this is doing a um, some sort of statistical study. Uh, in this case, they used a YAR rule that was looking for um, something in uh, what's called APT1 or comment crew, uh, which is a um, uh, basically a, a adversary group that was associated with the uh, Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army. Uh, they have a malware sample that the analysts over at Mandiant called Light Dart. Um, you'll find that people coming up with fancy names uh, for these things. Some are more humorous than others. Um, is very common. Um, but, you know, they did this to try and, you know, basically group their rules. Um, this is kind of how um, they're looking for it. So they're, you know, again, info's this, and then even the author's this. So in this case, um, you know, they are talking about Light Dart, APT1, um, the author of this actually came off of Alien Vault Labs. Alien Vault's another security company as well. Um, and then it's got, you know, some nice, like, semi-structured info here. Um, they're basically looking for the presence of every single one of these strings. However, um, they allow them to be either, um, or they're looking for them in the file to either be in uh, a wide, wide string format, which is... Uh, uh, common in Microsoft Windows, which is the UTF-16 format, um, or ASCII format. Uh, so in the lecture notes, I talked about how, um, by default, if you don't have any modifier at the end of a line, um, <clears throat> the string, or I should say Yara, assumes that the string is um, ASCII format. Um, but if you add any modifier to it, then it considers it to only be representing a pattern that matches that particular modifier. Um, so in this case, um, if they just added wide to the end of ret.log, then it would no longer match the normal ASCII UTF-8 version of that. It would only match the 16-bit uh, string. Uh, so they had to add the ASCII on the end of it as well in order to make sure that it includes the default behavior in addition to the new behavior that they defined. Um, so that's a little ca uh, gotcha sometimes uh, that's worth keeping in mind. Um, but basically, they're looking for all five of these strings. Um, they numbered them. Um, I usually recommend not to um, use very short variable names like this. Um, a lot of times, it can be very helpful to uh, try and describe or try and use the variable name to describe um, what each one of these things are. Uh, so, for instance, this might be a file name, and this might be a user agent string like the user agent string that a web browser sends to a website when it's uh, fetching a web page. Um, in this particular case, um, the APT1 group, uh, they were extremely notorious for uh, compromising a large number of um, publicly accessible blogs and other websites that were on the internet uh, that were um, that were that were used um, for kind of small business purposes or used as personal sites and things like that. Um, they would put their uh, server software on those um, systems, uh, and then they would get a very lightweight backdoor. Um, they would compile a very lightweight backdoor, uh, one using kind of a similar approach that I used for compiling the revolution backdoor. Um, they would deliver that to the targets, um, and then the malware on the target systems would actually just be communicating with that compromised website. And it would usually be fetching a uh, web page or something from it. And embedded within that web page would be a small command string that typically would be in the HTML comments or something like that. And so their trick was to try and kind of hide within the noise. So if you're a security analyst who's looking over this person's kind of network traffic and everything, 
all you would see is that they would be, say, fetching, um, say, the uh, web page for the website of a church or something like that, or the website of a uh, small, like, laundromat in Phoenix or something, right? Um, and you think that, oh, hey, that, that looks like normal user traffic. People go and browse personal stuff on their computers at work all the time. Um, that's another secret that you'll find out if you haven't found out already, is that um, no work computer is uh, limited to uh, work-related <laughs> use only, um, and it's just a reality that we'll all have to live within. Um, so because of that, uh, what they would do is they would try and you know, embed things like the you know, Internet Explorer user agent string in the, in the back door, and so every time we make a web request, they would pretend that it was the version of Internet Explorer on that user system, um, and then in this case, it would uh, you know, maybe Git, it would send a, uh, included in the Git requests, um, it might actually have uh, like an embedded date in here uh, to make it look like, say, the user was visiting a blog, fetching different pages that were um, related to different dates. Um, and in reality, each one of those date numbers actually means some very specific command. Um, so I might call this, uh, in order to make this rule more descriptive, I might would have chosen to call this, uh, say, you know, log file or something like that. This one user agent string, maybe this one error string one, error string two, and then this one might be URL string or something like that. Um, however, they didn't choose to do it with this. This was a really quick example they're putting together for, um, <clears throat> for this statistical analysis project. Um, anyway, this site's uh, really nice um, to kind of go and view and see um, all the different ways that people have used um, Yara for um, all sorts of different creative projects. So, um, <clears throat> let's see. So then I'm going to jump over here to one of the Yara roles that we have in here. Actually, I'll jump down here to show you another thing. Um, so another feature that it supports is the ability to include other rules as well, um, which is a very handy capability. Um, so so I've shown you this. So if you have a um, <clears throat> if you have a lot of rules that you've written over time, you don't want to keep growing them in one giant file. It gives you the ability to put them in multiple files because if I run it with the help again. Right here. Oh, well, this one actually fixes that problem. It used to be that you couldn't put multiple files on the uh, command line here, but it looks like you can now. Um, but yeah, so um, you can put multiple files here, or you can have one file that manages all the different files um, if you want. Oops. So I'll jump into, uh, say, one of these rules and take a look at them. So, so here you go. Here's that um, light dart APT1 rule uh, that the author of that blog was writing about. You'll notice that uh, they actually have a whole bunch of different rules. So this file was designed to group all of the rules that were related to this uh, group called APT1. Um, <clears throat> So FireEye actually posted, a um, back in 2012, I think, um, posted a large PDF that went through and did malware analysis on each one of these and looked at uh, multiple samples of each one that they had collected over time. Um, they put together um, all of this information, uh, <clears throat> and that's basically what's embedded in here. So it looks like, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the information was maybe converted to YAR rules on Alien Vault Lab site, and then the person who wrote this signature inside of the YAR rules repository ended up using the version that was posted at Alien Vault. So this is a very long file, but uh, let's see. So <clears throat> one of the other features that it has that's really nice because um, tools like grep and even a lot of the programming languages that you have don't have it. Um, is the ability to make patterns out of sequences of bytes. So we'll look at this. 
and look at strings, hexadecimal strings. So this is a really long one that they have here. And uh, it's a what I call a uh, hexadecimal string literal. But this allows you to make a pattern out of even non-printable bytes um, without it uh, being something where you have to put the uh, um, the C string escapes in there, right? You don't have to put the slash X and then the two numbers or something like that. So they show a little bit more advanced usage over here. Uh, so <clears throat> what you can see here is that um, there's E2, um, 34, so this will only match if basically you have two bytes that are these two right next to each other, and then they have to be followed by another byte. And then that byte has to be followed by the byte C8. And then that has to be followed by um, a range of byte values. So it'll support any byte value as long as the uh, first part of it is A. So A0 through AF. Um, it'll support and then followed by FB. So it's looking for a six byte string uh, and it gives some flexibility in the wildcard pattern here. So it uses um, the question marks as a way to define a, um, a wildcard value. And you can do a wildcard on a partial byte. So uh, if I wanted, I could have switched the position here and had the question mark be the first letter and then the A be the second letter and then it'll match on anything that ends in A rather than begins with A. Um, and again, these are the byte values. So this is kind of similar to um, if I was doing, um, let's see, those of you who are familiar with regular expression, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm uh, putting this just verbatim in the middle of here, uh, in the middle of the rule. Um, oops. So it might be like this. And we'll just put it here, right? So this is me trying to make it into a um, into a uh, byte pattern, hexadecimal pattern. You can see that that's kind of ugly, um, but the rule ran. So if um, if I had messed it up, and I'm going to do this. Right, so you can see it running. So it ran. If I had messed it up and I did something like this, let's see if that worked. Let's see. I don't know how to make a bad pattern, but you know, if I had done something like that, right? If I had screwed it up, uh, then it gives a nice syntax error and it doesn't try matching anything at all. Um, so. But basically, um, the pattern that you see on the screen is going to be the same as uh, the one that I originally pulled. Right? So these two are the same. The difference is that the lower one is a lot more readable than the upper one. And so and I'll make sure that I get... Um, uh, I'll just save these right here. <clears throat> I'll make sure that I get these, um, or this example, uploaded on the course website as well, because uh, it kind of um, demonstrates the power of the hexadecimal syntax. Um, the other thing I'll add, um, and some of you might see this as obvious, um, the one that I've highlighted right here, um, header, right? <clears throat> this is your fastest running pattern. So, um, because it's really just looking for plain text, so it can use a lot of the um, existing CPU optimizations for doing, um, you know, text constant searching. This pattern that has to use a much more complex regular expression syntax 
has a lot more power, but also a lot more variability in the um, uh, in the matching that it can do. So there's a lot more code to execute each time it's trying to do a match. So these end up being the most expensive signatures to write or patterns to write. Um, and then this one, one of the other reasons they have this right here, the syntax is a lot simpler, um, but there's a lot less matching that you can do with it. Um, but the side effect is that um, the matching time for this ends up being um, a lot closer to the matching time for this. Um, it's not as fast, but it's still a lot faster than the matching time for the full regular expression, uh, which is really nice because most of the time when you're doing something like using this, and I'm going to go here. So most of the time when you're using, there we go. When you're using this to try to look for unique sequences of um, unique sequences of instructions, uh, you're dealing with data like this. That's a lot more similar to the hex matching feature that's in Yara. So tools like Ida Pro. And of course, this one, but even um, things like uh, ndisassem. So if I was to do ndisassem u malware.exe, and we'll just pretend that it you know, works nicely, you're even dealing with extracting bytes like that, right? So, or hex dump is another common one. Um, so those are a lot easier to convert to something like this. So now, what I will do is let's um, let's look at the um, the malware file that I gave everyone for the uh, 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 for the midterm assignment, right? Um, or not the midterm assignment, the one that I packaged with last week's assignment. Um, so this is uh, this is one of the functions. So. There are a couple of functions in here that have some uh, decryption logic in them. I think it's these three right here have uh, various forms of decryption logic built into them. Uh, I've found, or not these three, but uh, this one up here, I think. Yeah, so this one up here has, uh, has some decryption logic built into it. Um, so I found uh, that Encrypting data and then decrypting it again at runtime is a common practice that a lot of uh, a lot of malware ends up using because it's a good way to hide, uh, conceal what's going on, uh, so that say anything that's scanning data that might be uploaded to a um, you know Dropbox or Box.com or uh, SharePoint or Google Drive or any of that stuff, um, it helps to evade any of the built-in antivirus logic that one of those companies might have. Uh, but it also helps it uh, avoid detection if it's sitting latent on your system. Um, so um, a lot of times what you'll end up finding is that in order to decrypt these buffers, you'll have a sequence of instructions that are kind of crammed inside of a, uh, in this case, a while loop. So I have that while loop right there that's highlighted. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for everyone. Um, so I have a while loop right there that's highlighted shows, um, you know, in this case, uh, and I think this one goes back a number of generations for this particular, so this is a piece of code I haven't changed for a while. Um, but basically what this is doing is it's uh, looping around a buffer and then it's copying stuff into another buffer from that buffer. Um, but it's only copying it in there directly if it is equal to um, character 55 or hex character 55. Um, if it's not equal to that, then what it does is it, uses XOR um, to basically encrypt it uh, with that byte value. So and then it stores that in a buffer, um, and then it puts a null byte at the end of the buffer so that it still looks like a string. Um, <clears throat> so if I go in here and I do this, and you might have seen it up there, um, 
I can actually go to the disassembly view and I can see the bytes that it thinks are rep or the instructions that it thinks are representing the loop that I just highlighted. You'll notice that um, in Ghidra, uh, it doesn't highlight everything, so it leaves these large gaps in here. Um, many times that's, a, um, uh, that's kind of an omission on Ghidra's part. It's very difficult for Ghidra to identically match one-to-one -one, um, the lines of C code along, um, against the lines of assembly code. Uh, so it ends up having some gaps in there. What I would do in this case um, is I would just take note of where this is and, you know, where the first code is highlighted. And then I would take note uh, down here that it's right before this jump to whatever that function is that ends in 73 or whatever that li uh, label is that ends in 73. So then I'm going to go back up here. Um, whoops. And I'm going to highlight basically everything until uh, that jump like this. <clears throat> and then when I do that, <clears throat> I'm going to copy. Um, so I don't know if it, uh, it may or may not auto-populate this choice here uh, where it says copy byte string, but that's what I'm going to want to do. So if you don't have that, I'll show you uh, where you can always find that, which is if you do copy special. <clears throat> and we did this, but we, uh, we did this before, but we chose a different option from this. Um, but if I do copy special, I can pull the byte string out like this. And I can actually have it so that it gives me it with the, with the spaces in between each byte or without. Um, one thing I will say is that, um, on Yara syntax, Yara really doesn't care if you have the spaces in there. It'll keep track of the position of the bytes, whether or not you have the spaces. The spaces are really nice just for readability for, you know, for you and me to see what's going on. Um, but I can copy that out and then I can put like, you know, XOR 55 loop in here. Yep. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> so, uh, let me just, uh, Try that again. Oh, I must have accidentally picked the wrong thing. So here we go. I'll do it the right way this time. And so there we go. We have the, uh, the byte string is now pasted in there uh, with everything. Um, <clears throat> So then you can use uh, whatever you want to use to, uh, you know, to format this across multiple lines. Um, I might choose to do like send it to the, the par command or something like that. Oops. And then that just gives me multiple lines to kind of work with it on. <clears throat> So the other thing um, that could be useful, so what this does is this is actually going to match the bytes uh, directly. So I'm going to say match, you know, all of them. There's only one, so if I put any of them or all of them, it would mean the same thing. But hypothetically, if I was going to go and keep working through this file and pull, pull more um, encryption routines out of the file to make more patterns out of them, Eventually, what I want to do is get um, go on to building a rule that's looking for all the patterns. So I'm putting that here. Um, and I'm just going to keep this in the rule file. So um, we'll play that I am working on kind of scratch project right now. So um, I'm kind of throwing my stuff in the rule file. Um, at some points in the future, I'll pull out the rules that have to do with that particular malware sample. Uh, but in this case, I want to demonstrate that that malware sample is not matched by any of the rules that we wrote for alice.txt. Um, however, I can still keep those in there without breaking anything. Uh, so if I'm working across many different malware samples, it might actually be beneficial to me uh, to have a lot of the different rules I've been working with uh, on the different projects I've been doing today uh, in one file so that I can see if uh, maybe 
there's some commonality among them or something like that. If I keep it in a file like that, uh, then it allows me to kind of reveal that while I'm working through it. But in this case, uh, there's no commonality. So let's see what the string looks like when I do the dash s. <clears throat> so you can see that it tells me that it matched on the XOR55 loop that I put in there. Um, and then what it does is it prints out the first, um, I can't remember how many bytes this is, um, but it prints out the beginning of the line. And if the line would go on and on and on for a lot of bytes, it'll just cut it off with an ellipsis. So this is, again, getting to, um, <clears throat> getting to the point about how YAR is really built for matching and trying to show you where those matches are. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the use case of uh, relying upon it for field extraction and data extraction um, is not something that's the focus. So a lot of times if you want that feature, so if you want your signatures, or if you want the output from your signatures to be something that then is reported or saved in a file and stuff like that, uh, that you're working on, uh, it may be a lot more reliable to pull out the position information and then have another tool that actually goes in there and extracts the data at those positions for you. So, but in this case, you can see that it matches. <clears throat> So one of the things that you run into, or they may run into, is that, you know, this, oops. I'll go back down here to the C code. You know, this 55, they may decide that in some newer version that they want to call it, that they want to use a different byte like 44 or 77 or 7F or something like that. <clears throat> so one of the nice uses of the... Um, One of the nice uses of the pattern matching feature is that while I'm looking at the code and being the malware analyst who has a brain, um, I might look at this and say, hey, I see what's going on here. <clears throat> when I deconstruct this in my head, I recognize that this is a value that, an arbitrary value that they chose at this moment to be 55 because a human on the other end made that decision. Um, but they could have easily chosen any number they wanted to, um, or maybe any one of a small set of values, right? Uh, so when I'm writing this rule, I might choose to make a conscious decision based upon that context that, hey, I'm going to maybe put the wildcard pattern in there, like that, right? And so now I've replaced the two occurrences of 55, which is the test that it was doing up here. And the reason why it's doing the test up there is so that um, when it's encrypting the string, it doesn't accidentally encrypt uh, 55 with, uh, you know, with 55. Because if it does that, then it'll make the string look like it's a lot shorter um, to, uh, to see, right? So it wants to leave the 55s in place. And then it also uses that value 55 uh, as the um, part of the XOR operation. And you can see that's actually highlighted up here in the window, right? So those are the two spots that 55 showed up. Uh, I verified that 55 didn't show up anywhere else in there, so I'm not accidentally patterning out some random instruction byte that I'm unaware of. And now if I run this, I can get the match like this, and it still extracts the 55 for me. Um, but now I have something broader that if the attacker in the future decided to use a different uh, key byte, right? If they decided to use a different, uh, you know, secret key for this or shared key for this, um, I would still match it in the future. So that's one of the nice features, um, you know, in there. Uh, the other thing. Um, and this kind of gets to when we were looking at, you know, I had you all walk through the different uh, strings that were inside of the file before to try to identify where the different, what the different commands were and where they were located and everything. And what code uh, they referenced. So one of the things I might do is I might go through and identify unique strings that I can pull out of here. 
So like these few right here are some really good examples. You know, this one's a good example. So what I can do uh, with this view is I can do something very similar, which is I can pull the data that's located in that particular cell um, by running a copy current column. And then, oops, and then I can put it right, you know, in here. Like that, right? So I can pull uh, the current column. If I was to just do a copy like this, uh, what it ends up doing, and this is very similar to the behavior that Ghidra does elsewhere, is it'll actually pull the entire row out, right? And that's not going to help me a lot because the uh, 90% of the information, or I should say 50% of the information in this row is not the content I'm trying to look for in other files. It's just metadata about that string occurrence in here. Uh, so I can do that. And then you can see that now I match both of these things. <clears throat> so um, one of the other things I ended up doing um, was I took some time to um, I took some time to uh, let me make this a little bigger for everyone. So one of the other things I did was I went through one of those and I um, the mouse integration not working. Well, I'm not going to restart the thing and, uh, and try and make it working right now. But one of the things I did was I pulled one of the other decryption loops out. This one's actually a lot longer. Um, and... Uh, I believe that this one was used for encrypting the data that was in the um, that was in the strings that it uh, was running up against the system info tool or something like that. Uh, and uh, it had a very complex um, substitution cipher that it was using. Uh, so I pulled that data out and I put it in these bytes here, but I can use the same approach with that. Uh, in this case, I might call it byte decrypt loop. And then a lot of times when I'm uh, working with uh, analyzing a malware sample or something like that, um, it's usually helpful to add um, you know, comments like this. Uh, I might even go so far as to add in, you know, say the, you know, oops. you know, stuff like that, right? So I might even go so far as to add in the um, full disassembly of the routine that I was looking at. So you can make these comments as long or as short as you want, um, and they can be, uh, they'll be very useful in trying to, say, detect this later on. Uh, the other thing, um, and this kind of gets back to me walking through the, uh, the different strings here. So... Uh, you can see, or if you recall, like these were different commands that you could run. But this here, um, this particular uh, value here wasn't one of the commands. Uh, this happened to be an encrypted string of some sort. Uh, and then these two, or these three down here, ended up being uh, three other commands that you could run from the command line. <clears throat> so as I go and do my analysis, I may find a set of commands that increasingly become a very unique match to this particular program. So there's a lot of programs out there that have command line interfaces. And maybe Shell and PWSH, maybe those two um, each are relatively generic. Um, and together, showing up in a file may still be generic, just not as generic. But when I'm looking for a program that happens to have maybe all seven of these commands in it, or maybe just five of them. So in this case, I put all of them, but I could very easily have like, you know, four of them, right? Great. 
So I might, you know, I could have it easily just give me a match on four of them. Then um, that might be a high fidelity match right there. Um, the other thing that I had was going through. Um, so if you remember, there was the, uh, the troll face string was on there. I'm going to actually do this because it was uppercased, but who knows how they might implement it in the future. Um, so these were additional strings that I found. Um, none of these three, when I looked through the code, were actually a command. Uh, I just found them to be strings that uh, maybe were referenced during execution or something like that. Uh, I think in one case, um, this right here was a was put into a message box. Um, I forget what this um, secret was used for, but it might have been for like the FTP password or something like that. Um, and then this might have been the username for the FTP server. So if you remember, there's a uh, FTP server component to this uh, that it will run uh, and any of the screenshots that you collect or any of the files you steal from the system will get uploaded to that FTP server. And then finally, um, there were two, or I should say I pulled out two of the encrypted strings. I might have pulled out more if I kept doing analysis, um, <clears throat> and I'm matching on those as well. Uh, so uh, one of the nice features that I like to do, um, and this kind of goes back to how it's very helpful to try to give good descriptive names to each one of the variables. Uh, in this case, I've separated these three, or I've separated all of these um what is there? There's like uh, maybe 11 or 12 different strings in here. I've separated them into three different groups, you know, three different groups of strings. Um, and then what I ended up doing was I matched them, and I said, make this string fire, or make this signature fire, sorry, make the signature fire if either four of these strings match or all three of these match, or any of these two match. And one of the things that I've found uh, when looking into uh, malware samples is that um, while this revolution backdoor was used, right, um, in the uh, example that I gave in the midterm, I pulled one of the functions from that other piece of code, the VM detection code that I had, um, I pulled one of the functions out of there, and I may have changed the string slightly from it, but by and large, the code that was already in there that was doing the work of trying to find out whether it's running in a VM or not, uh, that was still retained intact. Um, that's actually a common design pattern that you'll find, is that um, adversaries may be working off of a handful of large C files that have these different utility functions in them, uh, say, the encryption routines that I was pulling out earlier for the Yara signature, um, or in this case, um, the encryption routines that are used for decrypting each one of these strings. Um, so the adversary who maybe has limited amount of access to uh, machines to run backdoors and tools and things like that from could conceivably decide that Maybe they'll attack the system, maybe they'll attack some systems with the revolution shell, but they also find out that there's other systems out there that are not vulnerable or are not able to run that shell. They may have developed a different tool that works on those. And rather than also re-implement every single other feature and customization they've added to this one, we'll just start copy pasting stuff over there. Because that's what we do as developers is we copy paste stuff all over the place, right? So the adversary is no different. Uh, there are developers that have all of the same time pressures and uh, frustration with having to rewrite something from scratch. Um, so in this case, the one that I've highlighted here, um, if you, uh, you know, probably most of you should have figured this out, is a IP address that's encoded. And it's the IP address that's encrypted. That IP address, it would be very interesting if that exact encrypted IP address string showed up in any file anywhere, whether or not it's the same backdoor or not. Um, that also could conceivably be a very high fidelity connection to this particular actor because the IP address, um, you know, is kind of unique. Uh, but then the specific encryption value they chose to use for that IP address is also very unique. Uh, so 
you might be able to use this to go and dig through a large, say, library of malware samples that you haven't gotten a chance to look at in the past and find a completely different malware sample that's maybe a different backdoor that they're using in their toolbox um, just based upon, say, in the presence of an encrypted string like this one or this one down here uh, showing up in both places. Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of why I have the rule written like this, right? So um, make it narrow enough matching each one of these so that uh, in general it's going to retrieve something or recall something uh, as we, you know, as we say, it's going to recall something that is, a, you know, high confidence connection to this particular uh, malware, this particular attack. Um, but also uh, leave the door open that, hey, one of these might show up in it, and it may not be related to any of this stuff at all. Um, or one of the, all of these three might show up in it as well, and it might be indicative of reusing the FTP code with a completely different backdoor. So that's kind of the wisdom here, and those are some of the thought processes to consider when you're doing malware analysis and trying to convert that information into uh, your rules. So, <coughs> of course, I run this, and then there's the output of it again, just so that you all can see it. All right. We'll go ahead and uh, adjourn class for today. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to look at the, uh, uh, to go through the walkthrough uh, that I posted, definitely go through that. Um, I don't cover all this in it, um, but it's a good intro to this stuff. And then you'll have to do um, some elaboration of this second half of class uh, as part of the lab later on.